festive toxicology. Just a reminder, yes, it's Christmas, and this is where sometimes, not all the time, we do see a lot of different cases that is quite specific for Christmas. So tonight, I'm going to share seven common things that we see quite often in my career of things, just a little reminders that, you know, the things that we can avoid. Number one, tinsel. We love tinsel. Over Christmas, tinsel on trees, on fireplace, on windows, on bears, you know, they wrapped up chairs and things like that. And one of the things that tinsels are, they are very, very sparkly. And one a specific species, they like bright things. Cats. Cats, okay? Cats, they love playing with bright things. So it is not unusual for them to pull off the tinsel of the tree. They see something hanging, very bright, swiping at it. Which is all okay, nice and fun. It's not unlike our cat toy. But unfortunately, sometimes they ingest it, they eat it. Okay, and as you know, tinsels, usually, they're long. Okay, and the thing with long uh, objects is that when cats eat it, it can certainly cause a linear, uh, sort of linear foreign body obstruction, whereby it is, uh, yeah, it's, it's tricky, basically. It's, it's not a nice thing to have. And that is one of the common things that we see over Christmas. Mm -hmm. So just be careful, just be aware. Just be, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have any tinsels at all. Just be aware that there is such a thing. So, uh, for, for, for cats. Yeah. Um, raise up your hands if you've got a cat at home. Amazing. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so just watch, just watch your cats. Just, uh, just watch things on your cats. So that is track number one. Christmas, usually, not all the time, turkey. People enjoy having turkey, okay, yeah. which is very good. We all love it. Skin and bones are the two bits that you do not really, really want to treat your dog because it's not uncommon for dogs to come up to the table and you're like, oh, you know, it's Christmas. Oh, let's give Fluffy uh, something. Okay. And skin and bones, you know, if you're going to give something, okay, the, the, the meat is fine. Skin is way, way, way too fat, too fattening. Okay, and it's not unusual for them to get two common things. Indigestion, like literally they just oh, can't digest it and they just moan and moan and moan for some time because they're having a bit of tummy ache. Yeah, I miss that term, the indigestion man. Yeah. <laughs> and second one is pancreatitis. So the pancreas is, uh, we all have pancreas and it is responsible for churning out the enzymes to break down the food that they eat. If it is too fatty, a meal, they can get inflammation of the pancreas. Okay, and it's quite painful. Uh, one of the cardinal signs, not all the time, one of the cardinal signs is vomiting. Okay, and, and we <coughs> do a blood test and you check the pancreas, the, the, the pancreas level is way above scale and that's because they got pancreatitis. And it's usually triggered by a fatty diet. And the most common fatty diet over Christmas would be turkey skin. The second thing about turkey is bones. Okay, so people like to yeah, give a drumstick. Sounds good, you know, it's, it's a treat. Uh, but cooked bones especially, they splinter. Okay, so they can cause damage in two different ways. One is that they splinter, they can cause lacerations or vomiting. Um, and secondly, they can potentially also cause foreign body uh, obstruction. So that is something that we want to avoid as well. Uh, bones. So, turkey. Just be careful with that. Next one is, it's not even your fault to a certain extent. Usually pet owners who are very, very good at our medications and not wanting to give our own medications to animals. You lock your ibuprofen from dogs away very carefully. Paracetamol, toxic for cats. You lock it away very, very carefully. All your heart pills, all your whatever pills you have, you're used to it. And suddenly, what happens over Christmas? Your relatives come. <laughs> okay? Your relatives come. Not all, some of them, and uh, sometimes more commonly with the older relatives. Your grandfather, your grandmother. They come with their heart pills, with their uh, high blood pressure pills, <laughs> low blood pressure pills, and they leave on the table because that is what they do at home. Yeah. Then, the little doggy or cat goes there, whoa, okay, let's pick it up. That is also quite common. Mm. So I, I hear that quite common as well, is it? You know, uh, the dog or the cat just ate my grandfather's 
hot tablets. What's going to happen? So mm -hmm. don't forget, relatives. Mm. A blessing in disguise? Oh, of course, it's hard to say. Mm. You guys know. <laughs> <laughs> when they come, just be careful that you know your normal stringent or your normal uh, sort of a fastidiousness of uh, keeping your drugs away may not be as obvious because your relatives may not know the same rule and they may not know the habits of your dog. Mm. They just hoovers everything on the table and things like that. So, third one is relatives. Um, the fourth one is a. We have heard of this before, but it's also a little bit more common over Christmas. Uh, it will be grapes and raisins. Okay, so uh, Christmas pudding, mince pie, they all have grapes and raisins inside that. And what we know is that uh, they can certainly cause quite a lot of toxicity in dogs in, to, vary, uh, in, to, to sort of uh, different degrees, varying degrees. Some of them is very, very obviously they just eat one or two grapes and get into issues. And some owners I have heard. Uh, gives a grip to the dog every day since it was a pup and it's fine, so go figure. But certainly we do know that grapes can cause issues and raisins can cause issues. And interestingly, cooked grapes and raisins are actually a little bit more toxic oh, wow. than um, uncooked ones. Yep, so main spice and Christmas pudding, so be quite careful with that. Another one which we want to discuss would be, I think we're on number four right now, so number five would be um, just it's more of a winter thing. Antifreeze. Antifreeze, for whatever reason, is extremely palatable. They are very nice and sweet tasting. Uh, and cats love them. They lick, 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 lick. They can lick and drink. And the thing about antifreeze is that it is um, it's poison. It, is, it can certainly cause a lot of kidney damage. And that is also one thing which we want to uh, try to avoid. So just make sure the antifreeze is kept away properly. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, just because we are here and we, are, we, we want to learn a little bit more about this, does anybody know the antidote to antifreeze poisoning? Mm. Charcoal? <laughs> Sorry? Charcoal. Um, no. Wait, Charcoal wait, wait, wait. is more of a toxin. <laughs> yeah. So antifreeze poisoning is alcohol. So literally, one method, not the method, one method is intravenous in a cat vodka. That's been used before. They bind the antifreeze together. So, so the cat will be very, very drunk, but the cat needs to be safe. So that is one method that has been discussed for ages. Yeah. So uh, that is where uh, vodka has got medical qualities. <laughs> It's not just a drink. But yeah, basically it's the alcohol content, the alcohol component that absorbs or uh, uh, renders the antifreeze in the blood system. Okay. Um, um, sort of uh, harmless, so to speak. So, vodka as well. So, you get a very drunk cat, but see. Um, last one, okay, which is also quite a little bit more prevalent over this festive season is batteries and luminous um, fluid from those luminous necklaces or those earrings. Okay, so same again. Those, let's talk about the batteries first. So batteries, especially those little <coughs> tiny button batteries that you find in um, reindeer hats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So those little ones, they can certainly cause uh, potential issues. Okay, and um, because they're so small and it is not common for animals to ingest them. So just be careful of the little batteries. I'm not talking about the sort of D or C size or the, even the A or triple A, uh, A or triple A size, that is much more common. It's the little buttons that can uh, can certainly cause issues if there is any leakage in the batteries in the tummy itself. Then you can get um, sort of a very very caustic irritation. So that's one. The luminous necklace it is the the fluid itself inside there can cause quite a lot of irritation uh, for gastrointestinal issues in dogs and cats. So these are the seven common things which I wanted to share with you over this festive season to keep your animals safe and uh, for obvious reasons uh, keep yourself safe as well, don't ingest batteries or <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and just to let you know that uh, today everybody is going home with goodie bags and whatever I've said is all in the goodie bags so don't worry about memorizing anything at all but uh, any questions any other things that you think of, whether that's toxic or not? Any? I like chocolate for dogs. Ooh, Do you mean? Chocolate. Yeah. Okay. So chocolate um, is also another one. Okay, so chocolate 
uh, we can discuss chocolate in three different ways. Dark, milk, white. Okay, so the active ingredient in chocolate is this particular uh, chemical called theobromine. And that bit over there is the one that's poisonous in dogs. Uh, not so much in cats, but in dogs. Okay, that's been shown to cause a lot of issues in, in, in dogs. And the higher the content of the theobromine, the more toxic it is. Okay, and uh, it can cause kidney issues. And it can also cause vomiting and uh, just indigestion in, in general. So the rule of thumb is that dark chocolate is the most poisonous, followed by milk, and followed by white. Okay, um, white. When I say poisonous or harmful, white is a really the one that is really very very little. You need to eat a lot a lot of white chocolate per kilogram of dog to cause issues. So white usually I'm not so concerned. Okay, so white example. Um, I cannot remember the number off my head, but you eat something silly like for a 10 kilo dog, you have to eat like 20 kilo worth of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> something silly like that for white chocolate, so I'm not too concerned. If it's white chocolate, it's like, okay, yeah, that's fine. So give me chocolate, probably give me some indigestion, some vomiting and diarrhea, but you know, it wouldn't cause too much issues. Then, the dog yeah. So if those dog chocolates and cat chocolates, what they are actually is, they probably are shaped like a chocolate, but the, the, the sort of still roaming level is very, very low inside there. So that is how they market it, so to speak, but not mm. our own chocolate. Milk chocolate, it's sort of, uh, they have to eat, if I am not wrong, about a hundred grams per kilogram. But this is just a rough idea. So, so which means a 10 kilo dog will eat one kilo worth of chocolate mm. before it can cause issues. Okay. And just bear in mind, this is not gospel because some animals, they take less, some animals take more. Mm. So it's not as though you go over that and suddenly bad things happen. So, it, it, but certainly, milk and chocolate is a bit more harmful than white chocolate. Then kind of dark chocolate, and that's the one that is a unit very little. You're talking about like seven grams per kilogram. That's what happened to my dog last year. Somebody gave mm. me a present, and I didn't know that it was chocolate, so I put it mm. in the tree. Came back, and he was, yeah, pumped, yeah, pumped, so pumped and everything. Yeah. Dark chocolate is the one that is the potential <laughs> causes the most uh, issues, and that one they have ingest very, very little according to the body weight then uh, usually the treatment of choice is if we saw no immediately um, we will be advising uh, to induce them to vomit mm. so the, the more they vomit out the better it is I still remember last year we had a case where a dog ate a one whole bowl of, uh, one, one ball of Terry's chocolate That's not and a bad thing hmm? It's not a bad thing <laughs> <laughs> Then after that Did he tap it first? The, <laughs> the, the, ball, the point being is that when they came in here, we did one thing. And um, so, how many of. Raise your hands if you have your dog, if you had a dog that needed to be induced to vomit. Yes. Were you there? No, oh, no, I didn't see it. Oh, okay. gosh, no. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> chocolate. <laughs> to get them vomit out of chocolate um, in a pile over there. Oh, it it really pie? makes the whole. Sorry? Who wants mince pie? Yeah, it, <laughs> it makes the whole chocolate uh, so taste and feeling. It's like, I'm not going to touch the chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long, long time. <laughs> so it does put your chocolate in a bit. Oh, okay. And, and yeah. you can imagine, it just comes out a lot, a lot. It's like, it smells, the whole room just smells <laughs> oh, like yeah. a Willy Wonka's. <laughs> and like, warm, boiled chocolate, half of it. Yeah. But anyway, so, yes, so we do vomiting. And uh, provided that we do it quite soon, it's usually quite likely we get most of it out and mm. we just keep a close eye and fine. If we are concerned, further medication will include things like um, uh, fluids and taking bloods to check what's the kidney doing, taking bloods tomorrow mm. to check what's the kidney doing compared to the bloods today and things like that. So uh, that is if you want to find out more already. But a lot of it, for example, if it is kidney issues, is supportive treatment anyway. So we can give fluids anyway. So if we are concerned about that, we give fluids. Um, on the topic of chocolate, I just want to share one more toxin that is quite uh, uh, prevalent in dogs. It's, um, just let me just skip my head. This, 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 this xylitol. <laughs> Has anybody heard of xylitol? Yeah. Chewing gum. Exactly. Okay. Xylitol is an artificial sweetener that they put in chewing gum uh, for humans. Yep, and, and that, that, that is the one whereby xylitol can be quite toxic <coughs> in dogs because their body is not able to metabolize that powerful sugar uh, substitute and what happens is it just pushes their whole system to hypoglycemia and they get issues over there. The reason why I'm mentioning this is because it's in chewing gum and that is a very, very common thing that 
a lot of people have around mm. the house. And uh, another point of interest was that um, this was many, many years ago now. Um, Wrigley's, you know, Spearmint mm -hmm. Wrigley's, yeah. they were having a promotion. They were popping in free chewing gum in the post box, oh. and dogs were eating them, and you were seeing the vets more often than not. It was like, how are we stop doing that? That's what I mean. You know, it, it's a very yeah. harmless promotion. So we are selling like a hundred thousand one piece chewing gum in a in a post box, and uh, needless to say, you know, they, they didn't realize that you know the dogs behind post box they just chew up the mail and eat the chewing gum as well. So that also caused problems. So that was a fairly interesting. So is point. one piece quite toxic? Right? Same again. Dog to dog. Well, yeah, yeah, okay. Some dogs they need to eat two packs. Yeah. <laughs> Some dogs, one piece gets them total oh, hypoglycemia. Right. So it really, really varies. But we know the active ingredient called xylitol, and that's a bit that uh, needs to be quite careful. Mm. Yeah. I hope you guys have found this interesting. Yeah. 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 Informative. <coughs> um, yes. uh, any, so, any questions? Alabama rocks. Okay. What should we be looking out for? So. Main um, symptoms, sort of. So, Alabama rot, uh, good topic. Does anybody not know, not heard of Alabama rot? I don't know what it is. Okay. Alabama rot is a uh, condition <coughs> that came from uh, America, so to speak. It was first described over there. And the okay. sort of a technical term for it is a CRG, CRGV. Okay, so basically, it is to do with uh, the kidneys and the feet. Okay, so. Two signs which they usually get is that they get feet lesions and they get kidney failure. Okay, uh, the problem with Alabama rot is that they have not really actually found out what exactly mm. caused Alabama rot, mm. so they can't pinpoint it down to a virus, a bacteria, a protozoa, or a parasite, or they just actually cannot find the causal agent for Alabama rot, which is why they call it Alabama rot, which is very, very sort of a broad term, so to speak. But what we do sort of know uh, because of the if you do not know what caused it, it's very, very hard to give advice. Okay, and what one thing that has been linked quite often is muddy, marshy, wet mm. ground, mm. so to speak. Okay, so it must be something inside those conditions that is building this particular problem. So, usually the uh, situation would be, I mean, it was quite a lot of cases in New Forest. Yes. And um, so there's quite a few, not a lot, Quite, but a few has been noted in Devon already. Um, so I think uh, certainly uh, powder and vets just down the road. I think they diagnosed one last year. So we know it's around here. So the common thing when my members like yourself come and ask me, Lennon, Alabama rot, what do I do or what do I not do? I'm like, uh, no idea. Because <laughs> that is, uh, that, 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 that's, that's the whole reality of it. <laughs> having said that, having said that, the options, okay, because we know it is usually associated with muddy, wet, marshy sort of ground if you are mm. going to be very, very specific and particular and you want to um, have as safe as it can be uh, without something random stick to pavement walks very very boring totally if i say that you know it's no no nobody's gonna do it because it's not practical but that is what a dry thing that has not really been as a sort of being wet as you said the risk factor okay so the other way around to think of it is, yes, okay, you still can do your normal walks along, uh, you know, Teen Valley, along sort of uh, uh, Dartmoor and uh, all the different places, uh, Stover Country Park, you know. Things to watch out for would be to, uh, some sensible things to do is to wash them down. Mm. That's the most sensible thing to do, so which, which I would highly advise it anyway, uh, for a lot of different reasons, mm. for allergens, for skin allergies, for, um, you know, just, just, just a habit, really. Come dirt back, the wash them down. Just, sorry. Dirt on the carpet. Yeah, dirt, dirt on the carpet. There, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to mention that. I let, let you guys say that because like, yeah, I've got dogs. There we go. Different, we keep different dogs in different ways. So dirt on carpet, dirt on couch, usual, mm. usual things. And if they wrote in a lot of interesting things, it's not a bad idea to wash them down anyway. So wash down is just water wash down. I'm not, I'm not talking about soap bath or whatever. Just literally wash down. And you don't really have to be too fastidious with it as well. It's not. Washing, grooming, grooming. It's just just wash them, hose down, so to speak. So that would be my advice over there. Pushing onto that, how to recognize the Alabama rot. Okay, so some people they may be concerned. So what we're looking for is feet lesions, um, hair loss. Uh, sometimes it may or may not even be itchy or painful. So some dogs they may leave it alone. Uh, but the classic thing with Alabama rot is that there usually would be an associated kidney failure. Okay. So just because you get feet lesions um, doesn't mean that it's Alabama rot unless there's also kidney failure. Okay, then we can 
dig out a little bit more, <laughs> so to speak. And uh, so for signs of kidney issues, is drinking more than usual, eating more than usual, lethargy, things like that. So all I'm saying is don't panic when you see feet lesions. Oh my God, and Lennon said the other thing, you know, feet lesions, Alabama rod. Don't panic, <laughs> okay? It could just be um, mites. It could just be fleas. It could be anything that causes the dog to bite a bit more, skin is it allergies. Not kicking quite quick, though, when dogs mm. are taken for a walk. I've read that 24 hours later, mm. they can be they can be gone, they can be dead. There are certain cases like this. There are certain cases that like usually is days to weeks, but certainly 24 hours. Every dog reacts differently. It doubles like this. so. Yeah, it doubles like that one on the local uh, local news. I Means dog 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 died um, because they called the vet out and it, and it, and it died it died the next next day like. Mm -hmm. and that was very quick, like, um, unfortunately, and that was on, on the local news. And, and to be fair, as harsh as that sounds, I'm always asking, okay, what can I do? What difference would I have made? So, if it's going to die that quick, you know, the likelihood is that whatever you're going to do, it's not going to help anyway. So, where do we go from there? So, coming back to what advice do we give? Not lock it up forever. Vigilance. Oh, exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. So vigilance, washing down. Um, if you are fearful, then maybe don't go near the muddy areas. But like I said, there's really no correlation because dogs going there don't get it. Mm -hmm. but you know our circumstances, so we can't avoid it. Yeah, exactly. Um, but exactly. having read about it and read yeah. about it in a big yeah. way on Facebook, yeah. not yeah, yeah, only yeah. a couple of days ago. Yeah. Um, I just wondered, I mean, they said the dog started limping first before they noticed mm. the lesion. Is that normal? Does the limp come before the lesion or does the lesion... It varies. Really sometimes there's no limping at all. No. Well, sometimes it's actually not, it's not even painful. Mm. They just present the lesions, lethargy, then <coughs> kidney failure, then not very good. So to recognise kidney failure then, that's, do you say the dog drinks more? They drink more because uh, one of the functions or one of the big functions of the kidneys for us is to concentrate urine. Right. So if your kidney is failing mm -hmm. and you cannot concentrate urine, that means you just keep weighing more than usual, you get dehydrated, hence you drink more than usual. Right. It's a normal body compensation. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So that is one of the signs. Uh, but usually with those animals, they're also quite sick, you know, they're a little bit like not doing his usual dog thing. Mm -hmm. It's just lying down, mm -hmm. not exercising, not going, not interested in walks as before, um, not responding well. So you will see yeah. off color. Yeah. It's a yeah. thing you say that. That's why when it comes here, I, I'm always asking, as you probably know, how's the drinking? Yeah, yeah. How's the drinking? I'm always asking that just because I want to catch. And when you tell me it's more than usual, then I ask you, is it more than X amount of? Mm -hmm. So I don't know according to the weight whether that's uh, in relation or not. So that is uh, what we do already. Good question. <laughs>